Good afternoon, Dr. Jason Dunyon. You're a scientist at the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA in Miami, and you've flown over 50 Hurricane Hunter flights aboard a NOAA P-3, as well as the G-4 jet for some of the higher altitude research, both very bumpy rides. You're an expert in satellite analysis of both hurricanes and the elements that go into their strengthening. You've seen it all, basically. Thank you for taking a few minutes with us today to help people across Florida and all around the East Coast and the Gulf Coast and areas impacted within the Atlantic Basin, the islands, the Caribbean, the Bahamas, to talk to us a little bit about the 2022 season and some of the elements that you're watching that could influence the activity this year. I know it's too early for any kind of a seasonal forecast, but are there any specific elements this year as compared to years past that might lead to activity being different or equally busy for the 2022 season? That's a good question. It's never too early to start looking, right? You know, NOAA will come out with its May forecast and then it'll also have a follow-up in August. But what we're seeing right now, if you look at a few of the predictors, there's La Nina, it's a weak La Nina, and that tends to actually enhance hurricane activity. That looks like it's fading away and maybe we're looking at some neutral conditions out in the Pacific, which can affect our hurricanes in the Atlantic. So that could kind of be a wash for us. But one thing that looks like it's it's definitely ramping up is some of the sea surface temperatures out in the Atlantic. So our early look is it's pretty warm out there. And of course, that's the fuel for the storm. So I think we'll be able to refine things as we get to the May forecast. But certainly at this point, I'd say it looks to be average to maybe a little bit above average. With El Nino conditions, the anomalous warming of the eastern equatorial Pacific waters, there tends to be more wind shear than in non-El Nino years. And then, and then uh, on the other side of it, with La Nina years, where the, uh, the anomalous cooling of the eastern equatorial Pacific waters, it tends to reduce the wind shear in the Atlantic main development zone. So you get more systems and stronger ones. With that Enzo going neutral, where it's not, it's not El Nino, it's not La Nina, it's just about normal. Will there be any kind of a, a strengthening impact? And also, will that potentially affect the track of whatever develops? That's a really good question. The, those neutral ENSO years tend to not be a player with our prediction for what's going to happen in August, September, and even October. So, and, and you brought up a great point where there's, there's always this teleconnection when you're talking Mother Nature, right? We're talking about things that are happening over the Eastern Pacific Ocean actually affecting our hurricane activity here in the Atlantic. So I think that neutral element is really going to probably not be a big player into how we forecast. I think it's going to be things like rainfall over Africa. Um, it's going to be sea surface temperature, how hostile the winds are further east in the Atlantic. So at least early right now, it looks like ENSO won't be a big part of the prediction uh, for what's going to happen. But we'll certainly keep an eye on it. We have lots of buoys out there in the, Atlant in the Pacific to, to track those sea surface temperatures and keep an eye on whether it's La Nina or El Nino. Has there been any research done into actually determining the typical tracks of hurricanes once they form based on the the condition of whether it's La Nina or El Nino. In other words, if it's Enzo neutral, would that be a sign that hurricanes would curve away or maybe not curve away? That's a great question. I think one of the things that we've seen is El Nino, which you mentioned, when the, the winds become more hostile, especially in the Western Atlantic. So we might tend to see more activity shifted a little bit farther to the east. I think there are a lot of other predictors that may affect how a storm that comes off of Africa may recurve out to sea versus if there's a high pressure that keeps it you know, trucking along towards Florida. So this kind of neutral setup doesn't have a really strong signal for where the storms will go. And of course, we're not really good at predicting that. We, can, we have a pretty good prediction of the amount of activity, um, predicting how many landfalls and exactly how many storms, um, where they're gonna go um, is, a, is very difficult. Lots of great researchers are looking at it, but I think it remains a pretty open question. In the daily weather forecast on the TV side of the game, we talk about during the hurricane season very often that Saharan air layer, the Saharan dust. And out here in Florida, it can make our skies hazy. It can reduce the air quality. But it, of course, has some pretty serious impacts on tropical systems. It can weaken them, drying them out. It gets entrained into the circulation, transporting a little piece of the Saharan desert into that tropical system like a dry sponge soaking it all up and, and weakening them. Uh, we, we also talk about how various seasons in Africa as far as the busyness goes with, with tropical waves emerging from Africa can lead to more systems. 
if you have a, a really active monsoon season in Africa, you get a lot of tropical waves and you get more uh, you know, bullets in the revolver, if you will. Terrible, uh, terrible comparison, but you know, we're talking about a life and death thing here with, with hurricanes. There seems to be a balancing act of sorts between the Saharan dust from North Africa and then the monsoonal storm system from equatorial Africa. Is there any way to gauge what force from Africa may win out this season? That's another really good question. You know, when you think about the, those Saharan dust storms, they are about the size of the lower 48 states as they come off every three to five days or so and make their way toward places like Florida. And like you said, there are real hurricanes present. And I think one of the interesting things that Mother Nature's done is it's put this largest desert in the world and these Saharan dust outbreaks that come off the coast just to the north of the hurricane nursery in the Atlantic. Right. Over half of the storms that get a name in the Atlantic are coming from that nursery just south of the Sahara and the Sahel. And it's about 80 percent of the major hurricanes. So it's a it's really a place we need to look. And I don't think we have a great handle on one thing we know is these little tropical waves that come off of Africa. They're they're think of them as tropical disturbances. They're tied to some of these Saharan dust outbreaks. So it's almost like this play of the positioning of exactly where that that storm is going to be relative to this really suppressing dust storm is something we actually have to send the hurricane hunters out there to really sample and, and see how it's doing. As far as predicting, I think, look, as you said, looking at the precipitation in the Sahel is one of those predictors. If, if maybe it's more uh, moist in the, in the Sahel this year, which is actually there's some early signs that it may be, could that enhance some of the, the tropical wave activity uh, that we're seeing? And of course, enhancing those waves, we're enhancing the nursery, which is accounting for many of the storms that we see. So great question. We don't have a lot of solid answers, but we know where to look and we know where to send our hurricane hunters to try to get more information about how that might play out. That's really interesting. So if it becomes a, a little bit more of a, a, a wetter spring season in the Sahel region, the transition between the Sahara and, and then the more tropical, more uh, vegetated, verdant, foliated regions of Africa, if it's a wet spring, then maybe that would reduce the total amount of dust being pushed out into the Atlantic? It could, because that all that, yeah. that precipitation, that monsoon you're talking about, all that moisture comes up into the Sahel and kind of beats back some of that southern edge of the Sahara. So what happens early in the season could be important for what happens later on. And even with all that knowledge and all the satellite data we have, it's still not clear when some of these larger dust outbreaks are going to come. I mean, two years ago in 2020, we saw the largest dust outbreak we've ever seen on record. And we have some, some hints as to why it happened. At least, at least we can monitor it, but understanding these better, I think will help us better understand the, the seedlings that are come on, coming off of Africa and may form into a hurricane or a tropical cyclone. We're in very interesting times right now with, with the climate changing, the earth warming. Uh, so I wanted to transition into a couple of questions about that. Um, from the perspective of Florida and really anywhere along a coastal location in the world, but especially in Florida and in a lot of East Coast locations where the cities are close to the water, you know it being in Miami, uh, when there's a king tide, you know, the brickle will flood and various neighborhoods are underwater on a clear and sunny day. As global warming is leading to sea level rise, uh, Florida is expected to see in some of the latest studies as much as a 30 or 36 inch rise in sea levels, almost three feet inside of the next 50 years. So by the time we're old and crusty in the 2060s. Uh, what, what impact will that seemingly unstoppable change eventually have for the over 15 million residents along the coast here in Florida who, who live at the beach essentially when facing the hurricane season and seasons especially decades to follow? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I mean, I, th I think one of the things we want to do is try to mitigate that climate change and the effects that we're seeing. But the other piece is to try to respond to it. Um, and, and like you said, you could have a king tide where even on a normal non-storm kind of a day um, with the full moon or the new moon, we can actually have quite a bit of flooding along the coast. So that becomes an issue when we talk about the storm surge that a tropical cyclone a hurricane can bring, where those winds will push up the wall of water up against the coast. And you might have three feet of storm surge on top of those already high tides. If it's a storm like Katrina that hit near New Orleans, it might be almost 30 feet of storm surge. So, you know, the numbers don't sound much when you talk about inches in the short term. But like you said, some of the numbers are larger. But when you pile that on top of the storm surge that a tropical cyclone can bring to an area, 
you can start talking about a lot of devastation and, and really a need to start thinking about how are we going to mitigate this? How are we going to respond in the, in the future as things start to change? Because um, we have in Florida, it's, it's roughly three quarters of the population is along the coast. I mean, people like to live along the coast, but it does come at a price, especially in those vulnerable areas like, say, a Flo South Florida, Central Florida or New Orleans. So there really is a lot for us to think about, I think. And I think a lot of research needs to be done to better understand how these areas are going to get affected with this kind of this rising tide and, and rising seas in the future. Yeah, it's humbling to think about the hurricane season coming up versus one 50 years ago that maybe parents or grandparents talked about in Florida uh, as far as that change. I mean, if in 50 years we're talking about a possible three-foot sea level rise and we're seeing an inch or so every three years uh, on average, I mean, it's going to be a, a different ball game. So that is a, definitely some very good insight. I appreciate that very much. And, and speaking of flying into hurricanes, you had mentioned that. And, and by the way, I have nothing but respect for you flying into over uh, 50 missions into hurricanes. I, I had the chance to fly into one. It was Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and it was the bumpiest ride I've ever experienced in my life. I didn't know that turbulence could happen in the ways that it was happening. It was like being in a car accident every time you're in a penetration of this, uh, of this hurricane. Uh, but we were there during a very interesting point. It was right as Hurricane Sandy was making the turn to head up toward New York and New Jersey and become that benchmark superstorm uh, influenced arguably by the effects of climate change with the rising sea levels and the intensity that it, that it had. Have you, have you witnessed or, or seen evidence of in your research, both flying into hurricanes and with your, your satellite analysis of, of actual detectable changes due to those global temperature differences? Or is it still kind of theoretical at this time? I think it's, that's a good question. I think we haven't been looking at it long enough to really separate a couple of things we know are going on. One is we, we see this, we call it a multi-decadal cycle. So if you look at hurricane activity back in the 70s, 80s, early 90s, it was kind of at a low point. And actually the Saharan dust storms were kind of at a peak. Once we got into the mid 90s, we're kind of in this more active era. So there seems to be, mother nature seems to have this natural kind of oscillation of activity. So then you start to wonder, well, what if you have climate change on top of that? What if you're warming your sea surface temperatures, which is, is part of the fuel for the hurricanes? How does that play into a natural background that we see? So it becomes very complicated, and there are a lot of good scientists trying to figure that piece out. And I think my timing onto the scene was interesting because my first flight was into Hurricane Erica, maybe not by coincidence with the name of my daughter, um, but that was right at the beginning of, <laughs> of this really active era that we had. So yeah. in my experience, um, it's been very, very active for most of my career. Um, some of the old timers that I work with that flew back in the 60s and 70s, they have seen these oscillations. So I think, I think back to your question is that we know there's natural things happening and maybe there are some things that are, that are related to the climate change. And I, I think we have to pull those apart better than ever to really try to understand what can we expect in the future. A real quick side note, when I was flying into Hurricane Sandy, I, as somebody that is pretty okay with, with turbulence but had never really been uh, purposely trying to seek and uh, experience it firsthand in the sense of a hurricane, I was holding on pretty tight. Um, we had a couple of bumps, a little bit of dry air and training into the system, so it was kind of that clear air turbulence you don't expect. Uh, I looked over at one of the uh, one of the flight engineers who was on, on a brief break, and he was just flipping through a Brookstone magazine. I was freaking out. <laughs> I looked over at him and said, uh, was that normal? He's like, Oh yeah, no problem. And he just turns to the next page. It was just like it was oddly comforting that he was flipping through a <laughs> flipping through a maxi, relaxing during his yeah, break. Yeah, it but, takes some of those guys. It takes a lot to get them upset. And you picked a blockbuster storm to have your first flight. I hope you've gotten your hurricane certificate because if you haven't, we really need yes. to, to get that to you. I do, Paul Flaherty. Paul Flaherty uh, well, it was very nice to, to send me one. I've got it framed on my wall, and, and I look at it thinking how uh, how crazy it was to experience it, but but what an honor it was. We were up on NOAA 42. It was Gonzo, one of the P3s, yeah. and it you was a, a really strikes. good time. <laughs> I appreciate it. Well, speaking of hurricane hunting, um, I did that about 10 years ago. Are there any new toys, technologies that, that the hurricane hunters are going to employ for this season or have employed in recent seasons and may use a little bit more extensively beyond the, the drop sons, which are, of course, those tubes with a little parachute that measure the atmosphere on the way down to the surface? 
Right. And those, those are still our, and I'm going to actually show you one. Those are still kind of our staple, you know, these drop sounds of the parachutes, like you said, give us so much information. They're like little mini weather stations, but we're also starting to put a lot of inter interesting technology onto the planes. Like, you know, a few that come to mind are, we have a, a, a LIDAR. So it's a laser that can actually look below the plane and measure what are we seeing for water vapor that might feed the storm? What do the temperatures look like? Um, can we detect also Saharan dust below the aircraft? So that laser is able to tell us the kind of environment that we're flying through, which is really incredible. We're also gonna be, and I'm very excited about this, we're gonna be testing three new small UASs, so small drones, and they actually launch out of the belly, out of a chute on the P3s. So we'll get into the storm and launch them in May. Um, um, maybe not a storm, but we'll do some testing in May. And then hopefully once we get into August, September, we'll actually get into a hurricane and be able to test these drones. They, they look a lot like the drop on I showed. Only little wings pop out once it gets out from under the plane. And they fly for anywhere from 60 minutes to maybe two hours, maybe even three hours. And they're collecting data in the storm, in parts of the storm that we don't usually fly whether it be very low or maybe in the eye wall where the, the winds are the strongest. So they can give us a lot of valuable information, not only for the models, but for our research and also for the hurricane uh, hunter um, forecasters who are really trying to look at what's going on out there with the storm. So a lot of that's these things really are yeah, that's that's really exciting. Uh, I'm I'm picturing like a James Bond kind of a situation where the little switchblades come out and then the thing goes flying out of the belly of this this mothership, the P3 Orion. But I would say one other interesting well, thing we'll do is we're going to take our plane out to the East Atlantic. We're going to go out to Cape Verde, which is these little islands off of Africa, and, and try to better understand the things we've been talking about, these tropical waves, this nursery um, over Africa, and these Saharan dust storms. So I'd say for 2022, we've got a lot of interesting things on tap. Looking forward to it. That's really interesting. So, so instead of flying through the mature hurricane once it reaches the Western Atlantic, going to the very start of it when it's just a tropical wave or a, a group of thunderstorms emerging from the continent of Africa. Exactly, and it could be a really disorganized pile of th thunderstorms that later could become a category five, right? You don't know which, which one will intensify. So it's a really interesting area to look at to try to figure out what's making these storms tick and what makes one fall apart out in that part of the Atlantic versus one that later becomes a category five. Cool, well, thank you for your time today. Dr. Jason Dunyan, a scientist at the Hurricane Research Division of NOAA down in Miami, has flown over 50 missions into hurricanes. Kudos to you, sir, thank you again, and uh, have a safe 2022, and, and good luck in this hurricane season with all of the research. Thank you, I appreciate it, it was good talking to you.